can we safely say that Ukrainians already are done with their counteroffensive? They're at the they're at the end of it. It's petering out. Um, the signs that we're at the end is the fact that you know, to like today, Washington Post had a big story about the intelligence community telling State Department and others that the counteroffensive has failed and Ukraine will not make any progress. I think that is that's one of those indicators that uh, the the Washington uh, you know the the storyline is changing because. Prior to this, Washington Post was quite eager and willing to put out the propaganda and to tell a particular story. Now it's coming around and they're acting surprised, like, oh, this counteroffensive failed. Oh, how could that be? Well, I, you know, I was saying it was going to fail a long time ago simply because you did not have what Ukraine needed in order to succeed. It's been five months that Russians are on defensive. Do we know their strategy? Can we speculate what, what they're going to do? Are they going to go on offensive? I, I honestly don't know. Uh, you know, as you said, we can speculate. Um, the, the Russians have been building up their forces. Uh, it looks like they've also been uh, building up their, re re their material resources, ammunition, tanks. Uh, and other vehicles that would be necessary in an offensive. Um, so they've also um, strengthened their positions in Belarus and uh, all along the northern front of uh, the line of conflict. So they have a lot of options. Part of it depends upon what, what happens with the weather. The weather is going to turn here at some point in the next four to five weeks where the rains will make the fields impassable or virtually impassable. Uh, in the eastern part of uh, Ukraine. So, uh, you know, Russia's, Russia's going to move at its own time and its own schedule. They're not, they are not reacting. Uh, they are, you know, seem pretty purposeful in the, the attriting or causing the attrition of the Ukrainian military uh, in, in all facets, both troop level, uh, munitions, vehicles, and aircraft and air defense systems. Do you see any necessity for them to go on offensive? No, I think ultimately they do need to go on an offensive. I mean, they need to to demilitarize Ukraine. They need to destroy the Ukrainian army. That's simple. Uh, so that that is what's facing them. And the, uh, how they will do that, though, is, again, up to the general staff, General Garasimov uh, in particular. Um, they, they've shown a lot of People thought, have argued they've shown caution, uh, but but they're also, you know, they're trying to achieve a variety of political objectives and uh, avoid in going into a full-blown war with NATO and the United States if they can. They'd prefer to bring those countries to the negotiation table. Um, it is, the signs are that there's already, whatever unity existed in NATO uh, is already fraying. And, and so uh, at least some elements of NATO countries will start opening up and talking to the Russians. Cy Hirsch just published an article in, in this. He mentions that CIA warned Blinken that the Ukrainian offensive was likely to fail. If the CIA was warning Tony Blinken, why they decided to go on offensive? The, the, the warnings probably came over the last four weeks, three to four weeks. So... The offensive had already started. Um, the The real question is, at what point will there be a change in U.S. the rhetoric coming out of State Department, the public statements? So far, they still continue to insist that they are back in Ukraine and that this is going to be a military operation designed to expel Russia from uh, Ukrainian territory. As long as the United States continues to say that, it's going to continue to back a failed policy. There are signs that uh, the members, some members of Congress at least, are you know, growing very leery of continuing to uh, pour money down this rat hole that Ukraine has become. You know, just two days ago, Wall Street Journal published an article. They were talking about the next spring counteroffensive by Ukrainians. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. I how long can Ukrainian hold out with these strategies? Uh, if 
as long as the United States continues to funnel money to them, um, they will at least maintain some sort of presence, but their uh, capability to strike Ru and, and to strike Russia in any kind of effective military fashion is going to continue to deteriorate because one, the, the number of trained troops are getting killed and they don't have a ready supply of equally trained replacements. Um, secondly, the ability of the West to continue to supply ammunition and vehicles and tanks is also running up against shortages. So uh, the, Ukraine is all ultimately entirely dependent upon what Washington decides to do. And if Washington says we can no longer continue to uh, fund this and it's going to come to an end, I think Ukraine would be done in two weeks. It seems that United States is forcing Egypt to send weapons to Ukraine. Do you think it's a political move or because of the lack of weapons they're doing that? Well, I know that they've asked and tried to pressure Egypt to do it. But last I checked, Egypt had not done so. Do you have some other information? Point no, they didn't do that. They they refused to do that. But my question is that, what's yeah. the idea behind this request? Well, the United States is, we've run out, we don't have the ability to produce these uh, weapon systems uh, unilaterally. Uh, whatever we can produce is limited. And so we're having to rely upon other countries that we've in the past provided uh, the, these, uh, you know, the let's say the 155 millimeter rounds to, for example. So it's just, it's, it's a sign of U.S. and NATO weakness across the board. You know, this is, this is like uh, a guy that's pretending to be a billionaire, but he's having to go borrow money from uh, the middle class neighbor. You know, that's what's going on. United States says, oh, we're, you know, we're the big, we're the big tough guy on the block. We're in charge. We got all the money in the world. And hey, Egypt, uh, can we borrow some uh, weapons from you? Why do you have to borrow weapons if you're the biggest guy on the block and you're able to produce it? The reason is we can't produce it. We heard that the United States is going to send long-range missiles to Ukraine. Experts like Ben Hodges, he's talking about bombing Crimean Bridge. It's time to finish this bridge. Well, the, the, again, it's idle talk. They don't have the ability to do it. They keep trying to do it. And um, you know, we have to be have to be aware that at some point their actions are going to pretend if the West continues to get involved directly in attacks on Russian territory, then uh, Russia is going uh, to, at some point, strike back and start hitting Western targets. Again, I think Putin wants to avoid that. He wants to avoid escalating the war in that regard. But if pushed into a corner, uh, Russia will respond. Hey, look, Ukraine does not have the combat power to launch a massive devastating strike on Russia. Uh, it would like to have that. Uh, if it did, you know, it would require a significant, you know, large missile uh, uh, on the, on the, like the Iskander. But if they did that, the Russians also have defense systems quite capable of shooting them down. Uh, God help Ukraine in the West if they carry out something, you know, let's call it like an attack on the World Trade Centers that happened in 2001 that caused thousands of Russian casualties. That would then escalate this from a special military operation to a war in very quick fashion, uh, which would be likely to lead to the, the Russia eliminating, destroying U.S. satellites. Now, we would see the war extend into space. We would see military strikes on uh, military targets throughout Europe, the UK, and possibly the United States. So it'd be very dangerous, very dangerous. The Chinese defense minister said that China plans to expand military cooperation with SCO countries, Belarus and Iran. It seems that right. they're, they're shifting their focus. They were, they were focused on economy. Right now, they're focusing on their military. I just say how... What, how could they do otherwise? They've heard nothing but threats from the United States. Senior military officers talking about going to war with uh, China within two years. 
So the Chinese would be fools to ignore that and to you know focus only on the economy and not take appropriate military steps. Uh, the United States can't help itself. It, it, it's uh, I've never seen such craziness in my life, where our, our rhetoric we've abandoned diplomacy. We've made it very clear that uh, we're going to portray Russia and China as implacable enemies that have to be defeated. And the United States does not have the military nor economic power to defeat them. And the, the, we're going we're to find out, I, I fear, the hard way. We're going to push things to a, li to a limit. And then with retaliation by China and or Russia or both, we'll find the United States in a situation that it has never been in since the start of this country, uh, when it was it was last invaded by Britain during the War of 1812. That's the last time the United States faced a foreign threat on its shores. Uh, we'll now, we, we could very well find ourselves back in that situation simply because we provoke conflicts with countries that are not seeking to conquer us or attack us. It seems that the Biden administration is so willing to continue this war they can they can continue only if Congress continues to appropriate money, and we're coming into the the election season where people are going to be more and more focused upon what's going to happen in the twenty twenty four election. Uh, the first Republican presidential debate is next week, so uh, the ability of Congress or the desire of Congress to continue to send money to Ukraine when you know, Biden is talking about sending billions to Ukraine and only $700 a person to uh, people in Maui have been devastated by wildfires. You know, that's just not going to, that that dog won't hunt, as they say. It's a, uh, it, there's a, there's growing anger and bitterness towards the Biden administration on that. And the politicians with their finger in the wind, they're going to pick up on that. Do you see any chance for a Republican candidate to to win this election? Uh, if it's a fair election, yes. If it's uh, cooked like the last one, no. Because we know that RFK Jr. has no chance in the Democratic Party. They're not going to let him run. I'd, I'd actually, I disagree. Yes, he doesn't have any chance with the establishment Democrats. But uh, I think the Democrats are making a very dangerous mistake with him. Uh, in the same kind of mistake Republican establishment made with Trump in 2000. 15, when Trump announced he was running, he was a joke. He wasn't going to go anywhere. Well, he ended up not only winning the nomination, but winning the presidency. And uh, I think uh, Robert F. Kennedy is in a similar kind of situation <clears throat> where his message is going to resonate with a large number of people, and it could really overwhelm the Democratic establishment. RFK Jr. in his interview with Tucker Carlson, he was talking about that U.S. intelligence agencies funded the 2014 Maidan protests to the tune of $5 mm -hmm. billion. Dollars. In your opinion, what would be the real history of this war? What was the commencing point of this war? No, I think it was probably 2008 when uh, Putin rejected and made a direct appeal to not expand NATO to Georgia and to Ukraine. And uh, so from that point on, in fact, if you go back and look at public media, the coverage and the way Putin was portrayed started to change. So before that, it was, you know, Putin was seen in some aspects as a reformer, or as somebody who was, you know, not, not a corrupt bad guy. But after that 2000, after he showed that he wasn't going to get pushed around by the West and by NATO, all of a sudden the storyline changed and they started portraying him in darker and darker terms. So that and that that's what culminated uh, w with the uh, Maidan. I think in part it was also payback, pushback for um, Putin's uh, decision to accept the offer of invitation of Syria to come in and assist Syria in defeating the Islamic insurgents that were, in fact, being uh, funded, armed, paid for, trained by the United States and the United Kingdom. Putin didn't take Crimea. 
Putin, they did organize a referenda, a referendum in which the people of Crimea could vote. And the people of Crimea did vote to align themselves with Russia as opposed to Ukraine. You know, in that protest in Maidan, the studies showed that there were snipers in buildings that were shooting, the same sniper shooting protesters and policemen. Those individuals were probably paid for with money from uh, foreign intelligence organizations like the CIA, like the MI6 in Britain, uh, specifically designed to put the government in the worst possible light to generate, gen up anger against that government and to force it to abandon, uh, as it did, uh, the the power. And it was, you know, the, what happened after that event with the actions of the Congress were completely in, in contradiction to what was stated in the Constitution. But it happened. The, the West got what it wanted, which was now a pro-Western government in Ukraine, and it didn't matter that we aligned that the Washington and London aligned themselves with neo Nazis in the process. The ultimate goal of both the United States and the United Kingdom was to use Ukraine as a wedge, as a proxy to attack Russia, weaken and defeat Russia, carve Russia up into several parts that the West could eager, eagerly exploit economically. Because one of the one of the real sort of points of anger of the West with Putin is he shut down the oligarchs because many of those oligarchs had cut deals with people in the West who were losing money. So this is all about greed and money at the, at the root of it. It seems to me that they knew that Ukraine is not capable of fighting this war and they, they insisted well, on going to this war. <clears throat> what was the mindset of the Biden administration in those days? Well, I would actually disagree with a couple of your premises. Number one, they actually saw Ukraine as being militarily strong enough to attack Russia because recognize that within, even though Ukraine was not a real member, a legal member of NATO, they were a de facto member of NATO militarily because of prior training that had been carried out with Ukrainian forces. So the army of Ukraine represented, relative to NATO, the second largest army in NATO. So the West fully felt that um, that Ukraine was more than capable of taking on Russia. And that was an intelligence failure on the part of the United States because they, and, and the United Kingdom and all of NATO, uh, they routinely dismissed, diminished, you know, denounced the capabilities of Russia. They, they saw the Russian military as inept, the leadership as corrupt, uh, the uh, equipment outmoded, outdated. They were projecting onto uh, Russia what was, in fact, the reality for Ukraine. That's the irony here. So, uh, but they, they, fully, they fully expected that Ukraine, launching the war in this way and then anticipating an overreaction by Russia would bring in all of NATO and then NATO could defeat Russia. And it just hasn't turned out that way. There were two elements in this war. One, it was this fight in Ukraine. The other one was the, the economy part, the sanctions yeah. that were imposing on Russia. In your opinion, which one was the biggest miscalculation? Uh, I think the economic one. Uh, the West was very confident that Russia's economy was hanging by a thread and that sanctions would cripple it. <clears throat> ignoring the fact that in the entire history of using sanctions, I don't think we have any evidence there where you can point to one case of, of any significance where economic sanctions produced the change in the behavior of the country that was sanctioned. Uh, if anything, it does change the behavior of the country, but it seeks alternatives. Even Cuba, which has been crippled economically by sanctions over the years, has still continued to exist and has not succumbed to U.S. pressure and not opened its government into ways that would make the United States happy. So um, in doing this, trying to isolate Russia, they, in, they succeeded in drawing Russia and China closer together and making China and Russia more determined than ever 
to work together to create an alternative financial system that's not controlled by Washington, D.C. and London. Larry, one of the most amazing things that we saw after this war in Ukraine, those countries like Brazil, Global South, are not caring of what the U.S. is saying, what, what the U.S. wants them to do. The United, States has got, the United States has gotten used to ordering these other countries about. And now, you know, uh, like you would children. Uh, well, these, these countries are not acting like teenagers, older teenagers. Uh, who are 16, 17, and 18, and they're finally turning to the parents and saying, no, you're not going to tell me what to do, and I'm going to go on my own if necessary. And the United States, well, what's going to do? It doesn't have an answer. If you're going to erect barriers against a living organism, that organism is going to try to find a way around those barriers. And the fact of history shows us that there is no barrier or obstacle that man can create that cannot be countered, conquered, or overcome by another, by an opposing force. There is no such thing as the perfect defense. So uh, this is the, the United States was still in a position of relative dominance until it basically forced Russia into this war. And by forcing Russia into this war, the special military operation, it has sowed the seeds of its own destruction. The United States, positioned as the only sole world power, is in the process of being dismantled. Uh, the, the West does not have the ability to take Crimea. Ukraine does not have the ability to take Crimea. And Russia, I, I suspect, will actually be taking Odessa at some point. So this... You know, Russia will restore the territory that was once part of Russia. And the country of Ukraine, I believe, will not continue to exist in its current form. It'll be much, much reduced. It'll be a very small, poor country, poorer than what it is right now. If that's the case, why they're not considering peace talks right now? Have you ever been in a casino? Have you ever watched a degenerate gambler? who's losing, got losing hand after losing hand, keeps bait, uh, uh, betting more money and uh, more money and borrowing money and keeps doing it because it's irrational, but they keep doing it until they're completely broke and can't get any more money. Well, that's what the West is doing with Ukraine. Very, the very same thing. Just it's like a drug addict or a gambler uh addict uh they go until they they hit bottom and that they're they either die or they recognize they're going to have to make a change to survive are we going to have the same situation in taiwan was the taiwan situation is totally different from what we've seen in ukraine uh for right now but again the west continues to try to antagonize the chinese um and and the west uh, you know particularly here in america I still you hear people talk, even like this, you know, this kid that's running for president, Vivek Ramaswamy, uh, is talking about, you know, they keep talking about China as our inevitable foe and enemy. Well, the more we talk that way, the more China's going to say, okay, because China is based on its belief of its relationship with the United States, on what they agreed to in 1972 with Richard Nixon, that China, that Taiwan is part of China, under the one China policy, which the United States accepted 50 years ago. Now the United States says, oh, whoops, nope, we didn't mean that. Okay, well, the Chinese aren't going to back away from that. And it's in a, you know, we're in a unique situation where the, the, the importance of Taiwan within the semiconductor industry, producing semiconductors and having the, the key manufacturing centers there and, and on that island, uh, is, is potentially an existential threat to the West. But uh, China's in a position militarily where they can readily defend that island and prevent the United States from securing a, a foothold that it, from where it could attack uh, China. If we look at 2014 and 2015, these agreements that were designed to work, but they didn't work because the West was sending weapons to Ukraine to building up its military. Right. 
and we are seeing the same manner, the same the same attitude in in Taiwan. They're trying to send weapons to Taiwan instead of negotiating with China. I'm thinking that's going to be the new Ukraine in in Asia. Uh, it, yeah, it very well could be. I mean, that's that's one of the risks that that, and the United States could find itself again having to fight a two front war, which is not capable of fighting. When I say that again, uh, I noted that in 2002, when I was a Fox News analyst, I said that. At that time, the United States was uh, tied up in Afghanistan. I said the United States was not in a condition to fight a two-front war by going into Iraq. But they did. And we learned subsequently that the United States could not walk and chew gun at, gum at the same time. It, it basically failed in both ventures, in both Iraq and in Af- Afghanistan. 